tons of great talkers in the world, and talking is what seems like the Western world is really focused on. Likes talking, likes to hear someone talk, someone talks good and all the rest of it. That's really great. Great talkers are generally non-doers. They talk in the clouds, they blow smoke out of their ears and their <laughs> nose and their mouth, and they don't, nothing happens. We're more interested in seeing something happen. You don't have to talk about it, you can keep your mouth shut, but let's do it. destiny. Then secondarily, helping them to fulfill their destiny through human knowledge and financial capital. The idea is for Zella to come in and, and, and really empower, equip, and, and unleash, and then let people go, let people live, let people dream. It's more of a way of life, and so it's more organic in nature versus pr programmatic. It flows out of, you know, what's already there and then what's inside of people. In that sense, you know, it takes on a lot of different forms, you know, and you can't really tie it down. Zealot has become a lifestyle. It's a decision on choosing how you're going to live, how you're going to relate with other people, and how you want to be for yourself. The organizational goal is to transform communities globally. A person doesn't have to be a leader. Zealot's about human development. It's taking people who often don't think they're leaders, but they actually have something that's amazing that they could uh, share with others. Zealot is an organization that, that supports uh, people that are on the ground, the insurgents, I call them, the insurgents of love. Zealot's about opening every possible door into the community. There's the double lock door so that, you know, when we see somebody come in, we know who it is. The well is uh, a safe house, a uh, rehabilitation home for human trafficking victims. Our demographic at the well is underage, sexually exploited girls. This place to represent what we see in John 4, where we have Jesus meet uh, the woman of questionable past, and she comes to have a transformation through her encounter with Jesus. And that's the exact same thing that we, we hope for here. Well, I've been living here in Mexico City for four and a half years. And we had a layover in Mexico City on the way back to LA for five hours. So my wife says, let's go shopping. A taxi takes us to this artisan's market. And it was kind of like a scene out of a movie. It's like the taxi is trying to come break through this wall of people. And they're a bunch of young people and they're all looking in to the taxi and we're looking out. And the gaze that they had was this empty and vacant eye. You just saw emptiness, a hopelessness. And I knew that God wanted to bring light there. God wanted to bring meaning and purpose. Uh, he wanted to bring truth and love. If I love the Lord that God with all my heart, then I can make a sweet spot. The streets, that's my seminary. This is my sweet spot. Don't be looking to catch me in the institution. It's not going to happen. It was the disciples' prayer. When we first started meeting on the Skid Row, we ended up meeting on the street corner where most of the, um, the drug deals happened. After about a year, the street, uh, I mean, transformed in a major way. We've been there for five years this month. I lost my life. I didn't do nothing more. It's not God's fault. I'm not blaming God. I'm saying, but you don't care about it. That's all I'm saying. You know what? Thank you guys. Yeah, man, come on, man. It's nice of you, man. Yeah, man. I don't deserve it, though. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Dear, dear Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing our friend here. Yes, uh, How does a zealot define success? The way the world does is it's up and to the right. It's the, it's your scaling profit or numbers. With Jesus, he's the exact opposite. If you look at most assessment processes when they're developing leaders, they focus upon strength, gifts, and personality. And we feel that's uh, negligent because they really live a lot out of their pain. The uniqueness of Zealot's training and process, what we call the Zealot way, is actually to look at the pain and struggle and see how that can actually lead you to your destiny and can be your guide and your gift. I think there's a kind of gravitas that comes with 
having been through some pain. You, it's almost like it, you have like a certain depth of soul. Pain oftentimes is that vehicle that makes people, that gives them the compassion, that fuels their passion, compassion for others. I get excited when I, when I hear of someone who just, that's it for them. And, um, and I think the reason is because I myself was like that. I grew up in a very dysfunctional um, environment and I was very rebellious and uh, led me to do a lot of self-abuse, mutilation, um, just not having any regards for my own self and for others. I was involved with mafia, drug dealers, um, pimps, all kinds of stuff. I couldn't even see straight sometimes even though I wasn't drinking and I would get shakes if I didn't drink and I knew that it was so, I was gonna die. I pretty much knew that that was gonna happen. The more I walked, the more I realized, wow, it is my pain. It is my pain that allows me to have that compassion that allows me to have a hope that is huge. If you wanna sit at the table with someone and talk about feeling hopeful or, or even like how, you know, what it means to fulfill your destiny. Like, dude, if you haven't been through pain, I think you can look at that person and you can know that that kind of hope is, is not fire tested. You know, you have to, you go through pain so that you have a, a true hope that's been through the fire. A lot of times we don't get real unless we're connected with our pain. I was sexually abused by my neighbor as I was growing up. A lot of my childhood had been stolen away. And I felt that God telling me, you know, Benny, there's a reason why you went through that. And uh, even though you think, Benny, that you just want to protect your own children, what about all the other children in the world? What are you gonna do about that? And I felt at, like at that moment, God had me. I, I couldn't say no to doing something about it. We actually had to put this in, you know, in this room because we, we needed to be a room where there's no glass. Just in case there's a girl that's pretty violent, they've taken uh, pencil sharpeners and unscrewed the blade and start cutting themselves. The Zealot Way is not an easy lifestyle. You know, no question about it. It's not something you're necessarily wish upon your children or your best friends because it's actually a life of discomfort. To become a zealot is choosing obedience over passion many times. It's not that we don't like passion and we shouldn't be passionate, but you find Jesus' way was about obedience. I think about the people of Israel when they're in the desert, they lived in the tents, and every single morning they had to poke their head out of the tent and look up at that cloud. And if the cloud moved, they moved. And if the cloud stayed, they stayed. And it's like, <laughs> it's an uncomfortable way to live life, but, but the reality is we have guidance for the day. Every morning, man, I wake up and I say, okay, am I gonna do that again? Or am I gonna you know, revert to the norm, which is my own situation, my own desires, whatever. I've gotta give over to God. There's turmoil, and there's lots of change um, that my family has to adjust to because of what we do. I love my wife, I mean, she definitely is a trooper. She supports what we're doing 100%. Probably every day I, I regret not spending enough time with them. So yeah, our, our family suffers because of this. Um, I, I wish it wasn't the case. I mean, it's, it's always going to come at a cost. He's called us to go to a place of discomfort. And that many times will take us to a greater place in terms of fulfillment and also carrying out what God really intended to when it comes to loving people and loving Him. I think the deeper you go into Christ and the deeper you go into dangerous territory, the more radical you become. So you strip away all of that fluff that comes along with Christianity and that does
give you a lot of potential for being confronted, persecuted, even by Christian communities at that point. When you step out and be a catalyst for change and transformation, outside of your normal context, you start seeing an enormous amount of impact. Our best work we tell people is underground when no one knows that we've actually done anything. It's kind of like a special ops philosophy. This whole alleyway was uh, shut down recently. They uh, had a sex trafficking ring here where they were selling and buying women and children for the past 40 years. I think we need to turn around, hold on. We need to leave here. So I think Jesus Christ did this. I think he came into the world and as he came in, he, he, he countered the whole religious mindset of the world and said, baloney, it's not true, you know, I'm gonna do this in a different way. And the religious institution finally killed him and hung him on a cross. Today, I think we've gotta be willing to be hung on a cross. And if we aren't willing to be hung on a cross, we're not worthy of really following Christ into the thick of the deepest part of where he wants us to go. God does not call us to painless, <laughs> painless ministry. That's one of the myths of American culture, that, that non-pain and happiness is the thing we're after. We're not <clears> after <throat> happiness. We've got joy. We've got peace. We've got the joy of knowing what we're doing is right and good and needs to happen. About four months ago, um, we opened up a cafe here. As far as location is concerned, it's probably one of the best locations. We have events. We have times throughout the week where we just open it up. Our intent is to be light, to be that very same light that God called me here for. Thank you, uh, Assistant Sheriff Rangel, for... Uh... Great movements seem to kind of just happen, and they don't happen from top down, but they rise from the people. Those are the great revolutions. My prayer is that this would be a people revolution and that we wouldn't allow it to be hindered by, by hierarchical structures or by power-hungry people or by what we see as limited resources. Some of the most important people and the most important kingdom work is happening outside the church. And we need to find those people and equip them, resource them, support them. We think the mutants will lead the world. The people who have like these great abnormalities, um, are the unusual, peculiar people, the fringe, the freaks, the people whose society usually looks down upon, we say, no, you really need to look at these people. There's a reason why they're different. Our firm belief is that that abnormality actually is their superpower. They actually can be a thing, instead of being a destructive force, can be a great changing force in transforming society. You just have to be people who are willing to take action, not just sit back and talk and sit on any given Sunday and just receive. It has to be much different than that. I even told my wife, I said, honey, it's okay if I die. <laughs> and she was like, yeah, it's okay. I mean, you can lay down your life for this. We don't have to be this big old corporation. We just have to be focused zealots, willing to lay our lives down for each other and for its causes and then we can do great things. The hope's not this happy ending. It's that, like, this is, it's an honor to walk this road. But I say that knowing we'll get hit again, you know? Like, we're not done. Talking, it's like dreaming. Anyone can dream, but who makes a dream come true? That's the question, and what we want is people who make dreams come true. <laughs>